Okay, it looks like people are starting to roll in for the webinar. So um, hello, everybody. My name is Michelle Grossman. I am the convener of the Avert Research Network. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to the second of our Avert webinar series for 2021. Um, and we are really, really pleased to have with us today, uh, Professor Winifred Lewis from the University of Queensland, um, who, as you know, is going to be talking to us um, about when de-radicalization de goes wrong, applying the social psychology of persuasion in conflict to understand backlash effects in preventing and countering violent extremism. Um, Winifred is professor of psychology at the University of Queensland. Her research interests focus on the influence of identity and norms on social decision-making. Um, and she studied this um, very broad topic in context ranging from political activism to peace psychology to health and the environment. Um, and I can also tell you that Winifred runs an absolutely cracking symposium. Um, I had the opportunity to participate um, in a symposium on radicalization and approaches to uh, radicalization that she convened at the University of Queensland with colleagues um, a couple of years ago. Um, and it was it was both an insightful and a thrilling um, event. So. Winifred, we are really pleased to have you with us. Just before you begin, um, a couple of ground rules for everybody. Uh, so um, uh, participants will be on, on mute uh, throughout Winifred's webinar. She's going to be speaking with us uh, for about 40 minutes for her presentation, which still gives us plenty of time for questions and discussion. Please feel free as we're going to post questions uh, for Winifred um, uh, as she speaks in the Q&A or the chat functions um, that you'll find on the bottom of the screen. And when the formal presentation is over, um, we will start rolling those questions out uh, for Winifred um, so that she can respond. And um, the final thing that I would like to um, do is to note that uh, wherever it is that we're cited um, in joining this webinar today, um, we are on the traditional lands um, of the indigenous people where, wherever it is that we're sitting. And I would like to pay my respects uh, to their elders past, present, uh, emerging and also future. And with that Winifred, over to you. Thanks very much, Michelle. It's just such a pleasure to be here. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this um, fabulous webinar series. And I wanna also acknowledge that I believe my co-host of the 2018 Trajectories of Radicalization Conference is in the audience, Adrian Cherney, and um, a, a team of several others. So it was very much a team effort. Um, so I am a social psychologist and um, I'm gonna talk today about the idea of norms for violence and how that changes the motivation, but also the type of interventions that will succeed in de-radicalization agendas. And I'm gonna particularly talk about some tensions that can emerge between desistance, disengagement and de-radicalization agendas. And if there's time, which I, I can almost certainly guarantee there may not be, we can talk about the dismal implications of um, democracy failing for. It's highlighted by Michelle, but also perhaps by my accent. I'm a former Canadian and an immigrant to Australia. I have been at the University of Queensland now since 2001, and I've um, been working in this field of decision-making and identity for that time. And because I came to um, UQ just uh, days before the September 11 attack, I uh, published my first paper on terrorism in 2002 and the implications for interventions. And I've been working in that area ever since, most recently with many PhD students in Indonesia. Um, so I come from a social psych background and therefore um, we work a lot with these concepts of norms and identities that I'm sure you all know very, very well. A norm is a social rule or standard for behavior and an identity um, in the psychological sense is a subjective sense of being in a shared group with other people. So uh, we might be here scholars of radicalization. We might be part of the avert network, Australians and so on. And the norms that we follow attach to the identities that are salient for us psychologically. So I have many identities, but the one that's salient now is I'm a webinar speaker. <clears throat> 
So I get to speak without interruption for 40 minutes. And those of you in the audience are patiently listening for 40 minutes, something that you wouldn't do if you were in a conversation with your spouse or with a student. So those norms that are situational and that are attached to identities guide our behavior. And of course, group members are socialized actively into these norms. So people will teach you how to behave as a seminar speaker and more pertinent to our context, they'll teach you how to behave as an activist and even as an extremist. And they'll, they'll take on the group members, these behaviors as part of the identities that they have when they engage in um, normative behavior on behalf of their group. And importantly for our purposes, many behaviors vary in the norms that um, they have at different points in time for different societies and for different groups within a society. So some of us who are old enough would recall a time when it was very normal to see parents slapping children um, in the subway or in the trains and, and teachers even, if you're older still, um, could beat children with sticks in classrooms. Those days are gone and I think we all regret it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, of course, that's a fabulous norm change. But the point is when the behavior becomes less normative, the profile of offenders changes. And as the behavior becomes more normative, it becomes a, a different kettle of fish again. And that's what I want to talk about in this talk. The idea that depending on the social context and the norms that support the violent actors, the interventions change in their success. And I thought I'd illustrate the idea of norms for violence. It's probably unnecessary with this audience with some data on a different topic. So if we pivot over to intimate partner violence, and these are just some example data from the WHO 2005 um, statistics, what you can see is across the countries, you know, there is tremendous variability just in this handful of selected countries in terms of the prevalence of physical and sexual violence reported by women from their intimate partner. So that's very striking, but it's also striking that the construction of the types of violence even differs because some societies like Ethiopia have extremely high levels of physical and sexual violence that women are exposed to, whereas others such as Samoa or Peru have much higher rates of physical violence than sexual violence. And so once you start thinking about that, you think, wow, the, the type of person who's a, a, a sexually violent aggressor is really different in some countries than others. That's the, the thoughts that can go through. And it's even more profound when we look at something like suicide. You might think of suicide as an, a very individual behavior, you know, something that, that a person is driven to at the last resort. But in fact, as many of you might also know, the rates of suicide vary tremendously. And even if we compare the gender ratios, you know, some societies have gender ratios of two to one or three to one for men to women that commit suicide. Whereas in some other countries, the ratio is six to one. So there are profound changes that are occurring in the profile of risk and the relative importance of a risk um, uh, attribute like gender based on the context social violence that's even stronger again. So some societies would have conscription. They would extend that conscription to men and women controversially. And they might have compulsory military training. They might have norms that highlight the glory of death in battle. And they might have religious norms that promote martyrdom and so on. So these profoundly impact on um, psychology. And so the message of the talk in just a few seconds is that the prevalence of violence and the types of violence vary across cultures and groups. And that if we think about these group norms, we can bring the question of norm change to the center of our analysis, identity and norm change. And when we do that, we're gonna focus on different categories of perpetrator and um, intervention uh, factors. So to an Australian audience of your type, I know that most of you would recognize the so-called Lint Cafe killer, who a few years ago, um, identifying as a warrior for ISIS engaged in a violent attack that saw several people killed. But most of you, I think, would also know his history, which interestingly saw that a few years before his attempt to join one type of extremist group, he sought to join another, um, a motorcycle gang. And he went from this um, archetype of you know, the warrior for religion to on crime. So that kind of um, trajectory from one type of group to another, seemingly without any dominant ideological steadying force, 
is highly characteristic of non-normative violence. What we can define as violence that is not supported by your, your friends, your family, and the culture around you. So when we see people engaging in this type of non-normative violence, which is very strongly associated with lone wolf attacks or, or single actor attacks, we can um, see that the factors that make you more peripheral and that are associated with other forms of deviance put you at risk of perpetrating this type of attack. So the two broad categories as a psychologist that I would um, think of are social exclusion, such as unemployment, isolation, and discrimination, and self-regulation failure, including substance abuse, impulsivity, stress, and, and many others. And there, there are very many people working in this space, perhaps some of them are in this audience. Now, importantly, you can see impacts of more distal risk factors or predictors through both of these paths. So when we think of the special vulnerability of young people or men to engage in perpetration of non-normative violence, you can imagine effects through both paths or document them as some people have done empirically. So men being more at risk sometimes, minority youth, um, men more at risk to experience discrimination in the public sphere, to, to have higher unemployment, greater isolation, less close relationships to support them be greater at risk as young people or as men of uh, substance abuse, impulsivity, and to be under extreme stress often without support for self-regulation. And these types of risk factors are met with these types of interventions to address the categories of risk from a psych perspective of group cohesion and one's ability to self-regulate. So because we know that they are not attached to the norms of their group, the peaceful norms, um, trying to reintegrate them is part of the solution. So we can look at trying to build social cohesion both at the broad societal level, but even at the level of family, social integration of family and close relationships like partner and children. And we can um, engage in a variety of interventions that are known as um, in many contexts, uh, such as rituals of shared inclusion, celebrations of shared identities, um, attention to rejection and discrimination and attempts to monitor them and so on. And then entirely um, uh, complementary to that, distinct but reinforcing, mutually reinforcing, support on self-regulation. So for a person who's a non-normative violent actor, as for other types of criminality or deviance, Support for um, self-regulation can take both material, relational, or even symbolic aspects, you know, providing rest and security, explicit training around issues like anger, help with substance abuse, and self-regulatory challenges such as trauma, workplace bullying, and even physical heat, as you guys probably know, is a risk factor for committing um, public violence such as riots. So, um, uh, and, and integrated into this might be offering opportunities to meet unmet needs through other paths, such as pathways for sensation and meaning seeking. So the idea that um, you could intervene in a community by providing these resources that are gonna support the people who are at risk. But importantly, as many of us know, the predictors um, for non-normative violence um, seem to be completely different and in fact are completely different to the predictors of normative violence. So when we turn to um, concepts of a military or um, violent extremist group in the sense of a long-term group like the KKK, violent actors seen here, you know, celebrated in posters, marching in public, carrying flags in front of the American um, White House. This ideological justification means that the people who engage in normative violence are often not peripheral. They are in fact often poor and sometimes our military families or the families of martyrs um, through generations of people who engage in fighting are celebrated, are respected, are socialized. The more highly um, regulated and motivated and cohesive the group, the more violent in some cases. One marker of normative violence is the division of labor um, that emerges so that a normative architecture emerges so that some people are fighters, but there are support roles that are also socialized to empower and to support the fighting um, people. And there are really two dominant pathways to change of this type of violent extremism in the approach that I follow, which is 
attempting to change identities or attempting to change norms. Now, in fact, identities in conflict are highly salient. You can imagine just someone who is identified as a KKK member trying to persuade them to be less committed to their white identity is not necessarily going to be a fruitful task. Sometimes we do see that people polarize away from identities associated with groups that commit atrocities. And so that can be something that's um, quite marked and, and sudden. And more commonly, we might see alternative identities that are relational, in particular a parent identity, be a pathway to de-radicalization as the importance of the group identity um, diminishes in the face of other identities that compete for that allegiance. But in general, identities in conflict are highly stable, and therefore we face this interesting challenge of trying to change norms. Now, how do we change norms for a violent group? You might say with great difficulty and often without success, but um, we do know some key principles, I'm sure um, you would agree. And one is that it's an important foundation for that norm change to consider how the group is defining and constructing narratives about the relationship of their group to other groups. In particular, a focal element instrumentally is the benefit of violence for their group compared to the availability and benefits of alternative approaches in terms of symbolic values, but also in terms of concrete goals that the group is advocating for and trying to achieve. And perhaps most important of all, most clearly demonstrated time and time again, is that the people who that can best change a group from war to peace or violent extremism to politics extremists um, changing a movement from terrorism to politics. And we might think, for example, of Nelson Mandela, who is a revered peace leader, but who began his career as an active fighter. And so that's the direction that I want to reflect on, is that, that, that arc or trajectory of norm change from active fighting in a group to um, the cessation of that. Now, a point that I want to make before we pivot to an attempt to change group norms is that the uh, approach that you would take to evidence-based um, CVE or evidence-based social cohesion certainly has to depend importantly on the time frame. So as we often say, um, when people are asked, how can I stop or slow terrorism or violent extremism in Australia in the next six days? Well, you really have to arrest people, don't you? I mean, that's all you could do at that time frame. If we think ahead six decades, how could we reduce um, violent extremism in Australia and around the world? Then of course we have a civil society project where we we'll bring uh, attention to the inequalities and grievances that fuel conflict. And over a period of decades or, or years, certainly, we may be able to engage with and change those distal factors. But most of us here are interested in a somewhat more medium term agenda and I want to highlight um, that in approaching the rest of the talk, I'm really suggesting that there are complementary approaches that need to be pursued, sometimes by the same practitioner or with the same extremist, but often group might be marked by these um, patterns of criminality, dysfunctional attachment, and they need the support of um, people acting in roles such as social workers and psychologists who are helping them with their reintegration socially, um, connections with family and self-regulation. Of course, there are practical issues as well around um, access to weapons that need attention from uh, actors such as the police and alternative forms of um, need satisfaction and role models that might best be carried out by you know, teachers and family members and so on. But independent of that, a separate category, I believe, is a task of reducing normative violence by attempting to get groups to change their norms. And it's important that we think in those terms, because if we imagine that there's a particular group, and you could pick any, for example, neo-Nazi group here in Australia, the fact that we're able to stop that group per se wouldn't prevent the formation of other groups that then occupy the same social niche or respond to the same cues. So the norm change agenda for a group is not necessarily to end the group, but to see it uh, maintain and change in form. 
And so the historical pattern, for example, by which the KKK was responsible for hundreds or indeed thousands of violent deaths and arson attacks in any given year has now been replaced by a period of political mobilization with violent deaths or arson attacks that are much more reduced, you know, perhaps even to single digits. And while I think we can probably all assume that the audience is opposed to the KKK ideologically, <laughs> I want to highlight that in terms of the prevention of violence, the persistence of a group in a peaceful form can often be more uh, beneficial than the dissolution of a group that would leave that social ecosystem niche vacant. So it's in that context that I want to go on now to discuss the desistance, disengagement, and de-radicalization agendas. So my own background is in um, more normative forms of activism, you know, as, as a scholar and as a participant. So it's only over the last 20 years, like many of us, that I've come to this field from other fields. But now, like, like uh, all of us, um, I've been looking at the uh, various forms of de-radicalization. And as many of you would know, I assume, um, people will often talk about different types of de-radicalization agendas. And one common way of categorizing them is in terms of desistance, where the individual stops engaging in the violence disengagement when the individual leaves the group, de-radicalization when individuals stop endorsing violent system change, and ideological de-radicalization when they stop endorsing system change full stop. So for example, when we look at a group like his career in Indonesia, we might ask them to stop endorsing violence, or we might ask them to stop committing to the world Ummah, the establishment of the caliphate. And, and so those are the kinds of distinctions that I think practitioners look at. And you might think, to yourself if you're a practical person, well, which of these is going to be most fruitful? And in fact, what we see is that desistance is in some ways relatively straightforward and often achieved by capturing and imprisoning people or threatening them with jail for particular offenses. And so um, that is the a kind of go-to, a staple of security forces and policing of violent extremism. On another level, disengagement, some work by uh, Kate Burrell here in Australia, has encouragingly shown that at least at the time she was studying a few years ago, there's tremendous churn through violent extremist groups and that many people will leave naturally with a median stay being as short as two years in the sample, one of the samples she was looking at. And the major factor for disengagement is disillusionment, the perception that the group is actually ineffective, they're not attaining their goals, and often that the members are corrupt so they don't live up to the high standards and the ideals that drew some people to the group. So these are um, two pathways out. Now, in terms of the, the, um, the, the ending of violent campaigns um, without ideological de-radicalization, um, many of you would know the work from political science that shows that a plurality of terrorist groups over a particular period finished their campaigns um, by um, engaging by rejoining the political process and teetering back and forth across the line from politics to violence and back is very, very common, whether in Pakistan or Ireland or in other places. So um, that trajectory where people are imperfectly exiting and, and perhaps exit for a few years and then there's a relapse and so on is another pathway that is commonly seen. But I would argue that the final um, pathway, the ideological de-radicalization, where individuals abandon their cause entirely and stop endorsing system change, is widely seen as illegitimate in the target community and, in fact, likely to create a backlash. So one of the things I'd be quite curious to get feedback on is if you guys are aware of any successful ideological de-radicalization campaigns, because I must say I haven't come across any as I've been looking. So coming back to the, um, the idea that these three forms of disengagement and de-radicalization might sometimes work against each other, I want to put it to you um, as practitioners and as scholars, the disengagement and ideological de-radicalization are very common targets of intervention, but that after a deserter um, leaves a group in disengagement or um, an ineffective and incompetent warrior is captured, the group is more pure in remaining. So we get rid of our moderates, they disengage, we get rid of our incompetent people, they're in jail. That potentially leaves the group purified 
of the people that were under surveillance or that are more moderate. And if they're able to recruit and socialize other group members, the lasting benefit of um, disengagement and desistance are really open to question, particularly when we turn to the idea of trying to introduce norm change away from violence. When you can see that the association of anti-violence uh, moderates with deserting the group, with disengaging, could become something that stigmatizes the peace movement and that um, slows the progress of change. And I'm really influenced by the work of Neil Ferguson in Ireland, who has a number of papers. The first one that I saw was this one from 2018, but there's a couple of great ones in the last year, um, showing that the de-radicalization of Irish paramilitaries absolutely depended on having the commitment of ongoing uh, membership of former violent actors. So the, the fact that the violent actors had not stopped advocating for independence or for the, um, the, the Northern Irish cause um, was essential in the paramilitaries um, for the norm change to occur. And that was especially important as new generations of youth came in in the first months and years of the peace movement when the young people were impatient with the frustrations and um, obstacles in the path. So without having the moral credibility of the former violent actors in the first analysis with his colleagues, um, they wouldn't have been able to sway the group and the outbreak uh, relapse would have been much sooner and, and uh, more intense. So I thought that was really interesting and it's um, kind of led me um, down to this talking about or so. so. We can ask ourselves, well, who's best place to deliver change? I want to say I, I know of little um, evidence that anyone can deliver ideological de-radicalization, at least in the short term. I'm not aware of that as a realistic um, factor. What I think happens sometimes is that outsiders can create individual desistance and disengagement, particularly by creating or highlighting narratives or real events around disillusionment by offering cost-benefit analyses such as you know, threats and rewards um, and, and trying to reinforce alternative identities such as parenting and sometimes work and does work. But for that longer term where we want the group to dissolve uh, its violence but remain in place, holding, if you like, a barrier and they are committed to peace, um, then we do need insiders. And in particular, we may need insiders who are former violent actors because only they have the moral authority and credibility to put to the group that, that violence is not effective or in line with their values, whereas another tactic is. Okay, <clears throat> um, before I talk about what works, I just wanna say um, some data for those of you that, that don't know it um, about state in actions that actually have made things worse. Obviously, we would all be aware that some um, tyrannical or prejudiced politicians and parties can respond to violent extremists on one side by promoting hatred, discrimination, and even genocide on the other. So we would all be aware of that. But in addition, um, we would all, many of us would be aware that many terrorist autobiographies have narratives of illegitimate policing and that at the group level, um, Analyses have highlighted that, for example, communities that are more at risk of violent extremism often also have um, experiences of low confidence in police and perceived illegitimacy. Now, both in terms of the narratives in the autobiographies and in terms of the correlational data, we can ask the question, what about reverse causality? Of course, they see the police as illegitimate. That's because they're criminals. But longitudinal data, as you folks know, I'm sure, has actually highlighted that looking prospectively at the impact of some state um, counterterrorism in the UK and Irish context uh, more than a decade ago actually showed uh, not just an ineffective intervention, but an intervention that had increased terrorism in the context where it was administered. And that is something, of course, that was not in the minds of the security intervention or the, the policymakers. You know, when we intervene in other types of crimes, such as theft or um, uh, perhaps um, car hooning, usually we see either that the intervention doesn't work 
nothing happens or that it works. Those are the, those are the two. But I put it to you that in collective action and political violence, it is extremely common to see interventions that deliver a backlash effect. And we can easily imagine that if we, if we examine the impact of terrorists on the societies that they've targeted. So part of the narrative of terror is to create the counter mobilization, to create the reactivity. And therefore, um, when we look at um, how the state and um, violent extremists partner as they, um, they, they react to each other and act and react, a number of people in political science, such as Preliston, sociology, psychology, have highlighted the theme of mutual radicalization, the idea that security forces um, and protesters can radicalize and de-radicalize together. So the idea here is that if a particular cause, such as um, white nationalism, is associated with violent extremists, you know, a handful of violent extremists emerge, of course, that means that the security and intelligence forces will, will um, be activated and will monitor and engage with that community. But then the perception that they're being surveilled, that they're being coerced by the security and intelligence community is associated and reinforces the narrative that the state is corrupt and that there's a legitimacy to attempting to subvert the state or to ignore the constitution. And similarly, when the protesters or the nationalists are engaging in this subversive activity, it then legitimizes um, erosion of human rights protections and changes that, um, that create perceptions in the community that there's illegitimate actions by the police. And so this kind of drift up a continuum on both sides as people become convinced that the protesters don't deserve the protection of the state because they're acting illegitimately something that's true of a minority of the protesters, then engages in a vicious cycle over time. And I think I have a slide, which is actually um, from one of your papers, I believe, Adrian, showing that um, you know, there can be a vicious cycle where when the authorities see the extremists, they increase the course of surveillance, which means that the police are seen as illegitimate, which means moderate leaders who work with the police are just distrusted and discredited which means that extremists gain, gain ground. So from the perspective of a group psychologist, this is a very natural dynamic. It would be surprising if it didn't occur. And so we can think about how we respond to that then. <clears throat> um, oh, before we respond to it, we also can consider the mutually beneficial reinforcement and radicalization of Islamists and right-wing extremists. So the idea here is that I wanted to highlight Many people who have criticized state and community, um, or sorry, state CBE and PBE initiatives, and um, because they're contested and because the state is distrusted, have put forward the idea that perhaps community-led CBE is the answer. And of course, I believe it can be, it certainly can be, but there are increasing um, data from various disciplines around Australia and elsewhere to highlight that there are dangers in community CBE, in particular, the intuitions that people have often are not actually um, effective in engaging even the target community. So there can be social cleavages within the within the community that's being uh, actually lead to reinforcement of division rather than successful cohesion. Oh, I'm getting a terrible flashing. I hope you guys can see my slides. I've got some sort of um, instability. Anyways, I'll keep pressing on. I was saying that, um, for example, generational differences within the, the community that violent extremists are operating in might mean that, you know, reputable, moderate leaders that are well trusted by adults are not best positioned to reach out to the teenagers who might be most at risk. And there are many other types of cleavages that can derail well-meaning efforts. In addition, we have seen many times that community instinct about CVE partially takes the form of ineffective stigmatizing and othering attacks. There are countless examples from within the Australian context, but the European, the American context. So there tends to be a pattern whereby one group's violent extremists, hear me, <laughs> One group's violent extremists are um, provoking a reaction of hatred, of um, violent narratives, of rhetoric, 
um, that creates a, a vicious cycle at that same time. So we have two axes, if you like, of mutual radicalization. The mutual radicalization of the community and the authorities with respect to each other, and the mutual radicalization of the right-wing extremists and the Islamists with respect to each other, the Islamist extremists, I mean. Um, okay, so let me take a few moments, and I see that I've promised to finish in five, so we will go quickly. First, we'll recap what the problems are that we've talked about, and then we'll talk about what I think the solutions are. So I've said that some of the problems of creating norm change are these group boundaries that block trust and engagement and backlashes that are created, particularly when an outsider implies that your community is rife with violence. This actually can create a backlash in and of itself as a special type of, of harmful intervention. And I also have some, um, um, we could talk if there's time in the questions about the idea of issue-based identities. But let me just go on to what I think is an evidence-based approach for an intervention um, drawing on intergroup psychology. So let's imagine that there are these terrorists and, and we're authorities and that the terrorists claim they're acting on behalf of political opponents of the authorities, like opponents to the bombing in Syria or support for uh, American bases in the Middle East. And these political opponents in turn claim that they're speaking on behalf of huge constituencies like all Middle Eastern people are all Muslims. An ineffective approach is to draw a line between the authorities and the entire broad community. So all people in the Middle East, all uh, Muslims, there's a problem with Muslims, they need to be policed and surveilled. You, after the last 10 years, it's clear that that actually can create a backlash that worsens the behavior that they're attempting to address. What is evidence-based is to attempt to draw together the political opponents and the broader community in a relationship with authorities where people are able to articulate very clearly positive regard and common values, including questions like, you know, many Australians wonder, what will the war in Afghanistan ever end? What is the correct path? How can we get to peace? But you know what we're all united on? We are all united in rejecting the idea of having um, children's um, um, bodies on the road in Australia and violent attacks here. So creating that kind of narrative and sense of community. Now I put that forward as something that I hope is clear, but I think you might find it harder or easier to see how hard it is to deliver this intervention when we imagine neo-Nazis in Australia. So if we imagine that they're speaking on behalf of, they claim to be speaking on behalf of traditionalists and conservatives, who in turn claim to be speaking on behalf of all white Australians. It is very common actually when we see the interventions from community groups or policymakers even, to see people drawing a line and saying, you know, Australia has to take ownership of this problem. They have a racist past or the political groups have to, the conservatives have to take responsibility for this. It's their fault. But in fact, that it's completely counterproductive. There's little evidence to support it as a behavior change intervention. Rather, I think the evidence is very much in drawing a line that divides the white supremacists from traditionalists and conservatives who, of course, are united with um, the, the broad community as represented by authorities and leaders in rejecting um, neo-Nazi rhetoric and their uh, and um, first, a focus on groups, not individuals. I believe almost all the interventions must start from the assumption that there's cleavages and mistrust. If you don't start from the assumption, you can't identify the cleavages and mistrust and work with them. Um, then identity, which is both authentic and explicit. So I think oftentimes a mistake that's made is that it's presumed that there's a shared history of positive trust, that the authorities, you know, I'm, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. Um, so, you know, I'm sure I don't need to speak to this audience, but that's just not appropriate. It just needs to, to be communicated very explicitly um, why the shared identity and values um, can be trusted, what they are, and what they need to be real. And also um, there needs to be an emphasis, if possible, on positive change, which often means widening the time horizon. 
So for example, there may well be a problem of violent extremism in a particular neighborhood, in a particular um, family, in a particular community. But five years ago, that problem wasn't there. And if the intervention, if the intervention um, succeeds, then um, the um, then the family and the community will be freed in future. So if we are able to imagine that future time when the behavior has stopped, when the group has changed, then we can relate to the group from that perspective in a more positive way. Um, the last couple of points, because I see that I'm at my time, are to use other speakers in a chain of trust and to welcome half measures. Now this last point I, th I think is very non-intuitive for many advocates, but when we have, for example, a neo-Nazi who changes in a small way, um, but still remains committed to that I a distressing racist ideology and to violence, it would be very hard for many people, including family and community members, to see that as positive progress and to welcome it. But I believe that that is something that can be socialized and that can be taught, and that communities, families, interveners can be um, encouraged to understand the steps that people are taking towards that change in themselves and their behaviors and to reward them positively where possible. Okay, I think um, I can close there with my uh, last summary slide. Um, I'm highlighting that good intentions don't um, always mean effectiveness and that the intergroup relations and the mistrust is a constant barrier that our authorities and policymakers need to engage. And that some research um, has linked CVE programs and policing approaches to increase terrorism and radicalization, including in my own work. And that those two axes of radicalization are problematic for all the people involved, the protesters and the state that are radicalizing and the um, extremists on either side of a social cleavage that are potentially radicalizing. And using evidence bases to evaluate interventions and to demonstrate hopefully that they work and they can be changed the whole thank you You're muted. Yes, I'm sorry. I, yes, I am. Sorry, I've just unmuted myself. Thank you so much. What what a really fascinating presentation. Um, an awful lot to, to think about and, and, and to talk about. And I am aware that, that now we've only got about 15 minutes to do so. Um, so so let's move through um, through a few questions. Um, I'd like to start with one um, that, that that's come up um, in the course of the presentation. Um, and that is around uh, the the, the desist, desistance, disengagement, and then two uh, the, the sort of two twin uh, twin tracks of, of de-radicalization. Um, and it's really a question about age profiles. So one of the one of the sort of key things there is what kind of variance um, have you seen in your work around um, is it different for an adolescent? Um, compared to somebody in their 20s or their 30s. Um, we know, of course, from a number of studies that uh, natural attrition um, of the kind that Kate has, has written about actually takes mm. place as part of, the, um, part of the sort of life stage journey that you would see in a whole lot of other, other contexts. Um, yeah. But given, given the um, by now really well-founded drop in age profile, uh, for violent actors across a number of different ideological platforms, um, are, are we at the stage where we really need to think quite carefully about age-based interventions that are quite specifically tailored um, to that sort of adolescence transitional period with all that goes with it around impulsivity, um, uh, as yet only half-formed self-regulation capacity and so forth? Yeah. No, I really think you're on onto something there. So I think there's three issues that are really important. The first is, it is essential to recognize the different risk profiles for non-normative violence. And a lot of the young actors are very much in a context where no one around them supports this except the violent group. And that's a wonderful opportunity to try and get them away because they are not committed. You know, They haven't created networks within the violent actor community. 
But we do know from other areas like the American criminal gang context that in some cases, even young actors can be socialized into violent gangs that are, um, even though in theory they might be non-normative, they actually supported by family and friends in the community to a distinct level. So there would be some young actors, not so much in the Australian context perhaps, but certainly in some other communities around the world like we might see, that, that they would have potentially the support of their parents or a good chunk of their friends or perhaps a girlfriend. And once we start to see a relational normative support for our violent extremism, I believe that, that that needs to be recognized. So not all young people are alike, but young people are particularly likely to be attracted to this non-normative violence risk. They have lots of uh, categories of, of risk. If that can be addressed and targeted, it's much more effective. And the other question that's so important is how old are the leaders? Um, because there is a difference between feral young people um, who would be much more susceptible potentially to an intervention um, that included older adults that could, or peers that could build relationships, as opposed to many of the contexts, for example, in Indonesia, where there's quite a stable group of older leaders that are recruiting and exploiting the young people. And so there's a, an active intervention an active recruiting, sinisterly setting up things like bike groups or gyms to attract young people. So when we've got that predatory, exploitative relationship of older people, that again will change the dynamic. But that's just such a great question. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Winifred. Um, look, another question um, that's come up uh, in the chat is um, when you say that you know you've, you've you've talked compellingly, and I think many of us would um, would be familiar with this this analysis uh, that CVE can be both distrusted and contested uh, mm -hmm. at community level. But are you thinking specifically about that within the context? of the target communities towards whom CVE um, uh, uh, interventions are aimed or the broader society or indeed both? Uh, well, that's an interesting point about the broader society. I was focusing um, my thoughts and my analysis on the target community. That's a really interesting point that the broader community might also be skeptical. To the extent that I've thought about that, it was only to note in passing this paradox that all prevention work has that, that the more successful it is, the more the broader community is skeptical that it's worth doing and paying for about the target community. So for example, if we look at Irish people who are being targeted either um, to, to not go into paramilitaries or not support the IRA, if we look at um, Muslim Australians who are being uh, receiving CVE or PVE interventions that are around violent extremism, I think that um, you know, at times um, there has been a perception that moderates who engaged with the authorities in good faith and with the desire to help and to be part of a social cohesion agenda were um, made patsy or um, you know, were unable to protect the community to the point that I believe now many moderate organizations and many moderate um, religious leaders, many moderate actors, parents would, would now be wanting to hold the CVEP, the agenda at arm's length. Mm -hmm. And the same, um, and that's very dysfunctional dynamic from the point of view of social cohesion. That is absolutely not what anyone wants. So that is the, the, the spiral of reactive radicalization, which I think can be toxic to both sides where, you know, you can have well-meaning people, but once the dynamic takes hold, the community starts to withdraw and then the authorities are frustrated that the community has withdrawn. And, and I just think that that is a natural group dynamic and mm. that, that, that people should not be attributing any blame, but rather seeking to solve this natural group dynamic with some evidence-based interventions. Great. Okay. Um, another issue that's come up um, is, you know, the, the really fascinating argument that the, 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 both the, the state and non-state actors or sort of radicalizing <laughs> and de yeah, or I, I would actually say sort of escalating and de-escalating in tandem, right? That they're 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 sort of going in lockstep. And I think I think you know very very persuasive work by you and Adrian and others on this. But the the, the question here is is really about what other choices, what other choices does the state have? Okay. 
ha from a from a mm. political pragmatics point of view, right? We see the extremists, mm. right? And then you know, as as uh, yeah. Adrian and Christina have argued, we see them. Uh, the state responds and surveils them. This then feeds the narrative, right? That the state is illegitimate and corrupt, and you know, sort of on it goes. But what else can the state do? And I think this is this is a really pressing question. And, and, and it's possible that the state may be able to do any number of things. And then how is how are alternative responses by the state going to be perceived? And how yeah. does that in turn uh, feed into what you might call the appetite for both not only for security risk, but also for political risk? Well, what I think is evidence-based, and, and I'd like to qualify that by saying that there should be a lot more studies and that the quality of evidence in this area is extremely poor, um, you know, in terms of scale and in terms of um, distal variables and timeframes. But anyways, um, what I think is evidence-based is to define the target group extremely narrowly. So I think the knee-jerk reaction is always to generalize. And we, and we see that, as I say, on both sides. So, A protester might say, you know, all call, um, the police should be defunded, you know. Um, so these are very broad categories of reactions that are applied to the entire um, group from which the violent actors are drawn. And that scene is illegitimate um, and it provokes a reaction and distrust. So uh, a more, I believe, an evidence based approach is, is proportionate, it's targeted, and it's ideally accompanied by some sort of performative unity. So I think ceremonies of grieving are a wonderful opportunity in the depoliticized space to highlight common ground, common values, and rejection of violence. Um, other uh, rituals of unity that I think have been shown by people like, I might forget his name, but the, some work here in Australia, um, the I'll ride with you movement after the violent attack and um, was it a few years ago, um, mm. was incredibly uh, appreciated, mm. authentic, effective. It is very hard because there's a tension between trying to engineer CVE and having authentic um, behavior. But I think, you know, really we can draw on a degree of authenticity in articulating um, and, and expressing and enacting together yeah. shared common values, shared identities. I think that that can create community resilience when there's proportionate targeted measures that are directed at violent extremists. But I'd be really curious to hear from, you know, people that want to dispute that. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, we've got another question here that's coming back to the question of normal the normalization of violence. Um, so, uh, you know, Islamic yeah. State, one could say, is an example of an organization um, that has consistently moved to normalize the escalation of violence. So violence has become ever more important to Islamic State, uh, rather than um, uh, uh, oh moving towards a normalization to reduce that violence. Do you think this is a unique case uh, in, you know, across the spectrum of violent movements? Um, you know, is it the case that most groups do eventually uh, seek to reduce the normative use of violence? Uh, or is there another pattern here that we need to be under better understanding? Well, I'm curious to know what the ISIS experts in the room think, because my understanding was that after the early years, when we did see their dramatic embracing of these beheading videos and, you know, horrific uh, graphic gore was very much the staple of their outreach, this has in fact pivoted, and that they are putting out some quite um, bland is the wrong word, but, you know, they're certainly trying to trying to take ownership and to express alongside their um, highly violent calls for action, other um, more positively framed norms, values, and narratives. And I perceive that that is natural. And I perceive that when we look at the ISIS groups around the world, the ones that were most um, performatively violent are, are they the ones that have succeeded? I don't think so. In terms of the recruiting um, and in terms of the numbers, it's the, the enterprise of the, um, the new caliphate in Syria with all the promise of a, uh, a new heaven and families should come, bring your children, we're gonna create. And of course we know how that ended, but the point was the narrative 
was not of constant gore and violence, but rather that we would create this new um, um, uh, positive world of positive relations of peace of justice on earth. And the violence um, you know, falls into the backdrop in that narrative as well. So I am curious, but I believe that it is extremely common for groups to pivot away from violence because it's intensely disliked by most other identities. So you have to, to sustain violence, it has to have ideological justification, which is you know, constantly being disputed and undermined. And you also have to not have any other identities that are putting a break on it. Whereas many people do have identities, including parent and spouse, you know, but also other identities like religious faith or, or national norms, which under many conditions will guide people away or professional obligations. So it's very interesting, but yeah. I am, I am interested, someone I think said, um, worth discussing, oh, it's you, Michelle, worth bringing empirical data to this question. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, and I think, I, think, I, think that, I think that they are to some extent a special case. Um, that wasn't my question, but I would, just, I would just add that I think they do represent a special case because the, 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 the escalation and normalization of violence for Islamic State and the the pro-social, if you want to use that term, calls to build a new world, you know, the caliphate, you know, peace and justice, they were not sequential, they were simultaneous, right? Um, and they were, and they were to some extent, um, the, 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 the argument was that the only way to achieve the more pro-social vision uh, was through the profoundly anti-social um, measures that they were advocating. But look, can we can we move on um, to one to one more um, question? Really interesting um, uh, focus by you on the importance it, it, of what used to be called credible messengers, right, in the space. But actually, you know, about people who, who have the credibility, who have walked away or disengaged uh, or who have renounced. Now, it occurs to me, I can think of examples, since so a question from me, I can think of examples of um, uh, people whose whose journeys of transformation out of uh, a, a violent ideology on, uh, you know, right wing, um, you know, in, in, in right wing movements. One of the real issues is the lack of visibility, though, in relation to Islamist violent extremism. We never seem to know what happens to those who disengage from those who desist uh, from those who, who, who walk away. It, there's a kind of silence around that. So how, yeah, do we, how, do we tackle the, how do we tackle the risks of that lack of visibility? Well, I, I, think, I think we can actually ask ourselves, you know, is it possible to imagine an alternative approach? Like, I, I believe that in the Indonesian context, for example, there's a, a, um, a manga written by a former violent extremist that like charts this journey. There's some, um, you know, YouTube videos and, and an institute and so on. I mean, we do want to avoid drawing too much attention to the cause, but where the appropriate person wants to tell their story and um, share it, you know, are there opportunities to create a discussion? Here in Australia, I think the risk of violent extremism is so low that the advantage of broadcasting um, journeys of violent extremist narratives might be outweighed by the disadvantages, you know, but in certainly in some communities, in some areas where these narratives are actually being discussed, I do think giving more profile to former violent extremists and letting them tell their stories is very powerful. And we've seen that in Sweden, right? Sweden and Denmark, the former violent extremists are essential in the intervention and reintegration of um, high school kids or others that have um, tried that are trying to exit. So the support for um, for credible Voices is, is a, I think a, a, a positive in the in the context where the narrative is already out there. I mean, I think one reason why people are resistant is to avoid um, giving oxygen to the narrative, you know, to part one of the the arc, <laughs> part one where you say, and then I was seduced by the Nazi ideology. Mm. 
interesting question. We I, I, we could go for another hour easily in, in discussing and unpacking um, some of the very, very rich comments uh, and, and analyses and insights that you've offered, Winifred, but it's 6.01 p.m. And so unfortunately, um, we're gonna have to close. Um, on behalf of all the participants, um, this has been riveting. Um, uh, and, and, and very important, I think, in terms of um, raising some really key issues and questions and directions for how we might think. Um, I just want to close also by saying that your argument about shrinking the target, um, I don't know if you're familiar with an article in 2016 by John uh, Berger, um, who made exactly the same point. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Right. Um, exactly. and, and I think I think there is a growing sense that we do need to to recalibrate that that broad uh, pan community approach um, is probably something that needs to be rethought. So I would say um, to everybody here, um, watch this space. I think that there is going to be a lot more um, interesting and work and, and, and conversation and some choices to be made, too. But in the meantime, thank you so much for being with us, um, for sharing this work. Uh, the presentation will be uh, you know, has been recorded and will be uploaded, um, for which we thank you. And so we're looking forward to sharing um, um, your, your wonderful work and insights with an even broader audience who might not have been able to make it to the live streaming version. So thank you, everybody. And we look forward to seeing you um, at the next AVERT webinar. Have a great night. Thank you, everyone. And please do reach out to me if you're interested in conversations. I'm very interested in hearing what people thought. And thanks again to Michelle and the team for this great opportunity to speak to you guys. Terrific. Thanks again. Good night now. Good night.